Hi, I'm Damon Lindelof, and here's how you write a script. My writing process for an episode of television starts in a room with eight to ten, in some cases, a dozen people total sitting around a table and starts with sort of the question of what are we going for here? What is this episode going to be about? What are the plot directives? What, what's driving the characters? But more importantly, for me, it usually starts with a very simple question, which is whose episode is this? The audience is looking for a surrogate when they watch an episode of television. An episode is just a piece of a season. A season is just a piece of a series. And in some cases, it's very easy to answer that question, who am I? You know, who's my surrogate? When we were writing Lost, for example, that was a show that was heavily ensembleized, but the audience first comes in through the character of Jack Shepard. His eye opens up, you're with him, he wakes up in the jungle, he's wearing a suit, he doesn't know where he is, he's confused, he reaches into his pocket, he takes out a small bottle of alcohol, we go, we only see those in hotels and on airplanes, oh now a dog is like running up to him, where is he, what's going on, and eventually Jack will lead us to the crash of of Oceanic 815, and as he's running around, we'll see other characters, but we stay with Jack. That is our formative point of view. And in subsequent episodes, the next episode of Lost Outside the Pilot was a Kate episode, and we started showing you Kate's flashbacks. And then the third was a Jack episode. The fourth was a Sun and Jin episode. The fifth was a Charlie. I've tried to carry that approach in all of my episodic television storytelling. So if you watch an episode of The Leftovers, or if you watch an episode of The Watchmen, it should be very clear whose episode it is. Who is your audience surrogate? So that's the first question that I'm always asking is, who are we? And then on the heels of that, the second question is, what does that person want? What is their objective in this episode? And then you start to get into conversations about plot. Once that very broad-based kind of blue sky conversation starts to happen, we start to throw up ideas on the whiteboard that we all call beats, story beats things that we want to see in that episode. And those beats are basically the seeds from which the plants of scenes will grow. And by the time we're out of that room, we will have very close to a 30-page or a 40-page document of every single scene that is going to be in that episode. In some cases, with dialogue and buttons. A button is the way that a scene ends. And so by the time I'm in my office, opening up my laptop, ready to write a draft, in communion with another writer. I like to co-write. Um, that forces me out of my own rhythms. I'm constantly learning if I'm writing with somebody new. So I've got my scenes that we've divvied up. So I'm going to be writing about 30 pages of material for each episode. Uh, by the time I'm actually writing, all of those other things that I've just described have happened. So it doesn't feel like a blank page anymore. It feels like I'm just cooking pre-packaged ingredients with a very detailed recipe. The story has to always be in service, I think, to the characters and the themes. Otherwise, you're just sort of like doling out plot. You can't structure it in a linear fashion. You can't sit around the table and say, what are the themes of Watchmen? What shall we be pursuing? You start to talk about some of the themes or ideas that you want to discuss. In the case of Watchmen, we were inheriting themes from the masterpiece that was written in the mid 80s by Alan Moore and Dave Gibbons, the idea of the law and what's the line between a vigilante and a hero? How do we build upon those ideas? What was relevant in the mid 1980s? may not be as relevant in 2019, but some things are evergreen. And one of the things that we really locked into, or, or I was really interested in when I first came into the writer's room, was the idea of masks. A mask simultaneously conceals and reveals. That seemed really interesting to us, particularly as it came into the idea of superheroes. And when they chose their superhero identity, there seemed to be some sort of causal relationship with trauma. And once we sort of had those themes going, when we started to actually talk about story, we needed to do an origin story for a character named Hooded Justice, who had a noose around his neck and a dark hood that was designed very similarly to that of the clan. One of our writers, Cord Jefferson, said, 
I think that this guy, he was a cop in the 1930s in New York. He says, I think some of his fellow police officers tried to lynch this guy to scare him. And they cut him down and the noose was still around his neck when he was sort of wandering home in a stupor and he broke up this attempted sexual assault. And it was misinterpreted as some sort of act of valiant courage. But in fact, he was just working out the trauma of this Thing that had just been done to him. And so that's a moment where the story completely and totally locks into theme. And then that idea, that origin story that Court pitched, started to kind of connect to these other ideas that we were throwing around in the writer's room, and it kind of became our, our true north. There is this idea, it is a maxim that we should all apply to our process, which is write what you know. It makes sense. Like, why why would you write what you don't know? We want people to feel like something is authentic. They know that they're watching something that's pretend, but our job as storytellers is to make the pretend feel real. That's the spirit of what write what you know is there to protect, which is like, don't step outside of your comfort zone. It's a call to action to do research for that which you don't know. In the case of Watchmen, we're writing a story about the experience of the African-American community, and we're doing that very specifically through the lens of a small boy who was raised in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and in 1921, his entire society was decimated. There is no right what you know that applies to me in that story. And so you now have to basically pivot to find someone who does and collaborate with them. And when you start finding people who have direct relations to that story, particularly in the case of Watchmen, it was essential that we had not just one, not just two, not just three, but real representation, African-American representation in our writer's room. Once those individuals are now part of the creative process, they are going to ask the very um, obvious question, which is, what is it about Tulsa 21 that makes you want to tell the story, Damon? To me, that's the more interesting and important question that we need to be answering as writers. The challenge should be write what you know, but we should be able to answer the question, why do you care? Why this? Why now? And if you can find that thing and articulate it to others, then you are writing what you know. I found out about the Tulsa Race Massacre reading an article that was written by ta Coates in The Atlantic called The Case for Reparations. And it was just a, a basically like a paragraph. He mentions in 1921, there was about Black Wall Street in Tulsa, Oklahoma. It was this place of, uh, of incredible um, exceptionalism, black owned businesses that were prospering in rural Oklahoma in 1921. And I was like, oh, I didn't know about that place. And then literally two sentences later, he said it was burned to the ground within 24 hours and destroyed. And I didn't know that. And so I had this feeling like a profound shame I know that there is great inequity in our country on the issue of race. So the story of Tulsa 21 shouldn't have come as a shock, but the shame came from not knowing that it happened. And so instead of saying, this is a failure of my education, I just felt like this is on me. And that feeling is what kind of drove my fascination with how is it that this story has been camouflaged. It happened on such an immense scale. It was a hundred years ago. How is it that, that I don't know about the story? And the camouflaging to me became one of the central themes of Watchmen because it is a text that deals with fake news and hoaxes and recontextualizing historical events. And Tulsa 21, which was a real historical event, suddenly felt like it lived inside the fictional world of Watchmen. And as I began to express my emotional experience with learning about Tulsa to people of color who were sort of like, yeah, I've known about this my entire life. Or that was my way of saying, I don't know what I'm talking about, but I wanna talk about this. Can we talk about this? And for those who said, absolutely, you can do this. I did not hire those individuals. The ones who said, uh, this is gonna be problematic, but it is interesting. I hired because you have to go into it with a, with a high degree of not cynicism, but you have to respect the degree of difficulty and you have to know when to get out of your own way. And, um, and for someone who it's immensely difficult for me to let go, I really need to control things, particularly creatively. I went into the process of Watchmen saying, 
I'm gonna listen. And on the second day that we were all working together, I you know, started talking and everybody was looking at me like I was an idiot. And I was like, ah, like this is the room that I wanted. And I just stopped talking. And I started listening and it was not easy. It was infuriating and frustrating. But once I moved through that period of admitting to myself that there were others in the room who were more qualified and better at telling this story than I was, the show was able to happen. Not because of me, but in spite of me.